I've got to tweet this because sharing in real time is really important to me. Everybody smile. You're on my Twitter feed. So uh, that's actually going to happen. I was once accused on a panel when I was tweeting by an alternative company of cheating and getting secret questions into my ear. So you got to be careful. People know what you're doing. So uh, my name is James, and I work at a company called Pivotal, which is part of EMC's federation. And I'm here to talk today a little bit about people who compete um, with software and the kind of ethos platforms and tools that they use and how that might drive large organizational change over time with a concept we call platform as a service that I work on and an open source project that I work on called Cloud Foundry. <clears throat> the thing I've noticed over the last couple years is, is that software has really become the weapon, the ideal weapon of disruptors all over the world. Um, and that instead of the recession economics that we started with when we started the plot project in 2008, what we've observed today is that there are a large number of companies across diverse industries which are using software-based technologies to completely disrupt how those industries think about themselves and reorganize them. And one of the most interesting things about this slide is actually how often I have to update it and add billions of dollars. And uh, it gets easier and easier and easier to give this pitch the bigger and bigger these companies become. And so capturing the attention of a CEO or a CIO um, with the fact that change is happening in IT today has become more and more easy over time. One of my favorite conversations was comparing uh, two to three years ago going to Germany and talking to the auto manufacturers there and them saying, hey, James, we don't really need any change. You know, we're not really that interested in adopting anything new. And then I stopped back in this year and I asked them a question. I said, how is it that the fastest growing car company in the world by valuation is from my little hometown stomp of Palo Alto, California? Like, how did that happen? I mean, it's not a traditional rust belt access to core ore and steel manufacturing place. But what happened was that at the high end of the luxury car market, people had transformed their idea of what a luxury car was from a BMW or Mercedes uh, to a rolling laptop called a Tesla. And a Tesla is everywhere in San Francisco. I don't know about DC. I'm sure it's pretty popular here too. Um, but they'd really transformed the idea of a luxury car into a rolling laptop with software. And that really brought a lot of humility. And the, the head of Daimler, Ben, said to me, I'd like to join the Cloud Foundry Foundation this year. So that was an interesting transformation. The contrast agent I also use to talk to folks about what's happening and how important software is and living and dying with software is for companies and organizations these days is I use this slide. And unfortunately, HP was just up here before me, so not to pick on them. Um, sorry. Uh, but this is what's really fun about what EMC's done with Pivotal, is they've given us a whole company that has no legacy to protect. I mean, that's probably one of the most profoundly interesting things, is we're funded like a big company, but I don't have any install base to think, oh, hey, I don't want to disrupt that purchase order, or I need to keep you buying this. We're really starting from scratch on like some of these companies. And this slide came from John Chambers, who at his last Cisco conference wanted to brag that he was shrinking the slowest of traditional IT. <laughs> And congratulations to John, he's had a great run at Cisco. But who's not having a great run right now are all of the companies that are not very cloud and agile centric in IT. And so these traditional companies have been left behind since the 2000 era, 2011 era as a transition to a cloud centric computing paradigm has really taken over. And they've been left in the lurch. And what I ask leadership of major companies is, do you want to bet on companies that can no longer grow to be your growth engine in this time of change? And more and more, the answer is no, I need to explore something else. We've had really explosive growth at Pivotal this year, in part for that dynamic. And what's happening is there's a process revolution um, and the way we think about IT. It used to be you'd have people working in isolation on individual projects by themselves. We tried to bring them together into workflows to craft things in a more systematic way. But cloud platforms really changed everything, because as opposed to having to have 50 people work to assemble things, now a developer sits down at an API and says, this is the state of the world I want to see. Make it happen. And that changes everything. And one of the most disruptive things about our cloud platform is not really that people don't accept the technology. Almost every time I go and make a visit to, to speak with the leadership of a major company, they want the technology. What they ask me is, 
how can I get my individuals who are part of this old school process way of doing IT to come along with me? It's really about organizational transformation. <clears throat> One of the things that you'll observe that great pe people that are great with software do is they're able to release versions of it rapidly. Now this doesn't mean that you're slamming your users with the brand new color or feature every day, but what it means is you're able to run a process where you can deliver updates on a weekly basis at the least. One of the things I'm most proud of working on Cloud Foundry, and this is kind of funny, um, is there was a, uh, one of the largest investment banks of the world had an architect who hung out on our mailing list. And I started punking him because what I do is I tell our team, whenever he asks for a feature, give it to him. And so in two or three weeks, suddenly that feature would pop up. And you know, I was very flattered that uh, they, they came and said to our CEO, you know, we have a really world-class engineering relationship with this organization. <laughs> we keep asking for features and they keep popping out the other side. But the reason was is that we have this agile delivery methodology where we're able to ship things once a week on our platform. And that's something that most large organizations struggle to do. And as I was thinking about coming here and speaking to the federal, the federal crowd about it, it was really captivating to me that there was this phenomena in Silicon Valley right now to talk about the OTA loop and um, about pilots. And I was like, why are people in Silicon Valley talking about how fighter pilots think of their lives? And there's this feedback loop called an OBA loop where you observe, orient, decide, and act. And if you talk to Netflix or to Amazon, some of the engineers there, or to you know, Google or Facebook, they all want to say, oh, we have a faster OTA loop. We have a faster orientation loop where we can see a need in the market and respond and react to it. And I think the reason that fighter pilots and high-end software organizations have come to the same conclusion is that it's become a life or death struggle for agility. Like whoever can respond faster in that circumstance wins the market. And I think it's really interesting to think about how cloud and platform as a service could transform, come back to the federal space where this type of thinking came from and say, as opposed to this very stepwise manufacturing, manufacturing process of IT, how can we start to get to more on-demand cloud platforms that enable developers to really innovate? And I, I like the idea that what started in the Korean War in the Air Force came to Silicon Valley, might then come back to the federal space with a new kind of platform. So that's a very captivating idea to me. And the idea behind OTA loop is that time is the dominant parameter. Whoever can work through that cycle faster is going to win. The other thing that I've noticed, just to draw some contrast, that I like to joke to uh, some large organizations today that their model of IT is very much like the Maginot Line. Um, in World War II. <laughs> and that means they put up this strong fortress at the very front, but they don't have agility, right? And so what happened was when the Germans went around the Maginot Line, they had no answer. They're all sitting there kind of stuck in their process. They weren't able to respond. And this happened very recently at J.P. Morgan Chase, where there was a hack that invaded J.P. Morgan Chase. They compromised the systems. And if you look into this more deeply, uh, what you see is they said, most troubling to me was we couldn't change our systems even after we knew that we'd been compromised. And it was very much like that Maginot Line kind of problem, which is they had this strong process-oriented security around it at the front end. But then when they were compromised, they said it'll take us weeks to months to swap out any of our software configuration, to change it all. And we're sitting ducks until then. So I do think that Agile really applies to security as a matter of survival as well. And these two concepts really come together with a friend of mine, Adrian Cockcroft at Netflix, who's now a venture capitalist. And his two favorite things were he really admire, admired the OTA loop and Boyd and platform as a service. And he brought that kind of platform as a service centric thinking to Netflix because he wanted to inspire his teams to work faster through that process. And I know a lot of people in the federal space are very excited about the Amazon cloud and that's a big deal. And Netflix is one of the biggest proponents of Amazon. But if you look at what Adrian really proposes, it's not just using Amazon as it is, but building a platform as a service on top of it and allowing your teams to innovate. And they started off thinking about infrastructure as a service, but there were just too many steps. You had to go from a product management team and handoff, QA, um, and you really were still thinking about virtual machines. One of the really profound things about platforms as a service is that it allows you just to go from concept to deployment and you know, the way our platform, Cloud Foundry, works is that we just take the application that you want and we run it for you. And it's a really radical difference. So if you ever want a demo, I'd be happy to sit down with everybody here afterwards in the back. 
over my laptop. I'm just imagining this right now. Uh, and what happens is you take your code, you have a WAR file for Java, and you just hand it to our platform and it runs it and says, hey, how many instances do you want to run? How, what scale, what domains do you want this published to? What other apps do you want it to talk to? What are the security levers you want to turn on? And it just happens in about 30 seconds. And that's really what enabled Netflix to be one of the number one competitors in Silicon Valley and move through that OTA loop faster than anyone else. And so Paz has caught on. It's really much a very early days um, and there's a bright, bright future ahead of it. And I think if I come back from here uh, a year from now um, to talk about this, you'll see that the very largest organization of the world that we're talking to in manufacturing, financial services, um, cars, uh, media, have all really started to glom onto this concept of platform as a service. And this is the CTO of WebEx at Cisco, who's a very accomplished engineer, also helps work on MIT at the SIP protocol. And he said that PaaS is really the operating system of the cloud now. And instead of thinking about just turning on these virtual machines one at a time, we can deploy code that speaks to all of them. It's like a net new operating system. And he said that really for there to be a profound transformation though, you need an open source ecosystem around it and that is Cloud Foundry. And this is really strong validation coming from a third party. And so there's been this large movement to standardize the industry on this open source platform we have called Cloud Foundry because it fits into the time that we live in. It fits into an age when you want agile development and agile developers to be really empowered to do what they want. When you think about all these trends that are happening, happening I heard the HP speaker talk about mobile and analytics and um, connected and all of these things. How are you gonna get your organization to go do that and adopt it if you don't empower your smartest developers to go solve that problem? Like, are you gonna be able to solve that sitting in big meeting rooms together, all doing it together? It's not gonna happen. What you need to do is to take a small, as they say at Amazon, two pizza box team at most. That means that most 10 people empower them with an agile platform to go start to solve those things. That's the only way that truly algorithmically complex problems get solved in computer science by organizations is empowering their smartest people. So we're very excited about the industry momentum around Cloud Foundry. Um, HP, IBM, SAP, Rackspace, um, Accenture, Capgemini, uh, Verizon, Swisscom, and there's many more coming have all joined the Cloud Foundry Foundation to help us establish this open source standard and contribute to it. We're gonna kick off the Cloud Foundry Foundation um, in December, and it's gonna start with a over $9 million a year just marketing and operations budget, not to develop the code, that's what all the contributing organizations do, but just to help drive that as an industry standard. GE also invested uh, in Pivotal as a company, $105 million. And you think about a classic large organizational problem, GE has one. It's owned 16 of the largest businesses in the world, all independent of each other. And what they needed was a common innovation platform to do those next generation Internet of Things, connected analytics, um, emerging software together. And so Jeff Immelt um, spoke with Paul Moritz, the CEO of Pivotal, and they decided that GE would standardize on the Cloud Foundry platform as well, to the point that GE also invested and in now is a 10% owner of the company. So we really are trying to bring the best of startup innovation to large organizations. When you use a platform as a service, what you see is that there's this old world where uh, how long does it take in, in your organization to get something done? Oftentimes people say, hey, it's eight weeks per step or six weeks per step. Hey, I need to configure the load balancer. I need to order a server. Or I need to set up the middleware. And suddenly in platforms as a service, it all happens in seconds through three or four commands. And it's really a revolution in the same way that if, does anyone remember 1993? Anyone? Were you around in 1993? What did you have to do? You know what I had? I had? My dad had a camcorder, right? You remember that? And you had a Walkman that wasn't connected to the camcorder, and maybe you had a pager, and then maybe you had a Polaroid camera, and you had these 12 different devices that you kind of hacked together to do what you do now with this, right? And that's really what Platforms of Service has helped these organizations do, is instead of a different load balancing from one company and middleware from another and an operating system from another and deployment technology from one and monitoring from another, it's all in one platform, really tightly integrated. And so it stopped having that human bad interface glue in the middle. It just says, hey, tell me what you need to do. I'm gonna do that all as one platform. So that speed and agility with three commands is really crucial. The other thing that it does is it opens up what cloud you can run it on. So one of the virtues of Cloud Foundry is that you can run it on an Amazon, you can run it on vSphere, you can run it on OpenStack. And you can also then use almost any language that you want to develop on top of it. 
So you've really given what I say, both your CFO, who's deciding what kind of infrastructure to buy and what kind of data centers to build flexibility, as well as your developers flexibility in terms of using the services that they want. If they want to use Node.js, because that's popular now, you don't have to completely change your IT process to do it. You just can't. If they want to use Java, they can. It's very open and pluggable. And so you have really fast productivity in both of those dimensions. I wanted to show you a quick demo, but I wasn't able to get the video integrated, and I'm going to tell you about it instead, which is really not as effective. But I'm going to mention that one of the things that you see when you watch Cloud Foundry in action is you're able to deploy an application for the first time in under 20 seconds. That kind of gets people's attention, like, hey, I went from code to running application in under 20 seconds. The next thing we do is we show you a scale demo, and it's not necessarily that you have to scale every application in the world all the time, but we want to show you how fast that change happens, and we scale 300x in around 30 seconds. The final thing that you'll notice when you see a Cloud Foundry demo is that we take away 20% of the capacity of the system. So it's not just about making developers happy, it's also about operators not getting paged in the middle of the night anymore. That's going to enable the entire organization to want to deliver software. We take away 20% of the capacity and suddenly it's rescheduled automatically across the remaining capacity that it has. That means that Cloud Foundry is completely self-healing. So in addition to that developer productivity, you get operational benefits. And on a trip down to Texas to a company where they make uh, one of the most exp expensive fighter jets in the world, this is what really resonated with them. They said, you know, we have a hard time really keeping all of our software available, even while we're working on these mission critical things. It would be amazing if we had a platform that did that for us. But what we find today is that most organizations are not ready for this because they've built IT. This is the truth. We've built an amazing technology. And where I end up as a therapist sometimes to these leaders, and they say, okay, well, this is amazing and perfect, but how am I going to get all these people that I've got to start thinking this way? Because what I've done today is I've created an IT bureaucracy where between each step and each function that we have, we have somebody to get an approval from. And that's really the call to action for the people in this room is to start thinking about how do you sponsor that change? How do you start to think about an organization that empowers people to act um, and using a new kind of platform that speeds people up in terms of how quickly they can solve hard problems? We advise that you do it in two ways. One is by empowering developers to move faster than ever before um, and have agility. And the other is to empower your operators with a platform that is self-healing and automatically controlled. So when you do those two things at the same time, what happens is you find that it's much lower risk to push new code. It's much easier. Your developers are moving faster. And your operators aren't giving them heartburn anymore. Because as they push the code to the platform and it runs in a self-healing way, suddenly they're not as reluctant to make new updates to that software. And when you change that dynamic on both sides, you really get organizational change. And we say this is taking, turning your data center into a software factory. So Cloud Foundry does all of these things in one platform. And this is this iPhone analogy. Um, as opposed to having 12 vendors across all of those fronts, it automatically configures the uh, servers to run the software. It schedules it across thousands of servers at once. It applies network security at an application level not at a, just a virtual machine level. And that's really important because as you deploy that application, you start to say, oh, what is the security rules I want per app versus per VM or network? And I, that's an important distinction because before, if you had an application, you had to go, then go down into your interfaces for virtual machines and think, where does that app live? Now you're saying, okay, I've got an application and I want to provide security rules around that application, go. So this is our multi-cloud third generation platform. We sell a product called Pivotal CF. And it allows you to operate these key services across each of these clouds. Um, a CI service for continuous integration, our elastic runtime, which empowers developers with agility, as well as a series of data services from Hadoop to Redis to RabbitMQ for messaging. And what you've done by implementing this platform is you've completely changed the game from handing your developers virtual machines to saying, now you've got the tools you need to go deliver innovation for my organization. And that's a very different proposition than doing traditional IT. Let me just uh, finish on one slide here. So our reference customers that came, you know, we, we launched this crazy new idea after years of R&D this year. And I've got to be honest with you that given, I knew I had a great technology, but you know, how fast large organizations would adopt it, I wasn't sure. And I'll come back to those first two slides as the reason we've been so outstandingly successful this year because the pressure is on even large organizations to start to adapt to change and to start to deliver innovation is so high. 
that after only six months in market, we already had these blue blood brands willing to stand on stage and talk about the success that they had. Um, Philips Medical Systems had to transform themselves and do connected APIs for all of their medical devices so they wouldn't be supplanted by things like iPhone Health and other new startups over time. They chose Cloud Foundry as that platform. They said, we're gonna go build all of our new connective APIs or analytic services on Cloud Foundry. We're not gonna do traditional IT anymore. Um, a Monsanto company said, this is how we're gonna go make fields more productive over time. We're gonna be able to tell farmers how to plant food like never before and automate systems. Um, and build all of that on Cloud Foundry. So we had a lot of success, and there's far more than these that have spoken publicly, already excited about Cloud Foundry after only six months. And I can't wait to come back and give you an update about all of the traction we have in large organizations next year. So just to wrap up, what we see is that as organizations adopt this approach, they change their infrastructure as a service costs, they reduce that because they have more efficiently scheduled um, applications across their infrastructure. They empower their developers with large savings in terms of time, energy, and attention. And they transform operations from being a, let's go fix that ourselves, to having the platform fix us kind of style. So I think that's a very exciting change over the next 10 years for large organizations. As they think about cloud, don't just think about virtual machines. Think about the platform that runs on top of them that enables your organization. Um, and think about how that orientation loop that fight, fighter jets people thought of to survive can affect your organization in terms of how fast you move through each step of the process. So I'm James, and that's what I work on, and thanks for having me.